Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization, RP Plus, Hypertrophy Concepts and Tools, Lecture 21, Phase Potentiation of Volume. Ooh, fancy. This lecture actually answers a ton of questions we get on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all the other social media outlets about MEV, MRV, how they change over the course of multiple blocks and when it is a good idea to really pay attention to them to make sure we are not off course. So we're going to talk about phase potentiation, just a general review. But then we're going to talk about how minimum effective volume tends to trend over the course of multiple mesocycles in a row over the training block. We're going to talk about how MRV trends over the course of a training block. And we're going to talk about the problems that arise when those two get really, really close to each other, as you can suspect, maybe not the greatest thing. We're going to talk about why then a maintenance phase might be a good idea. We're going to talk about what that implies for the block design and some uh, quirks of how to alter these things during fat loss dieting to make sure that all of them still apply and nothing gets really, really quirky. So phase potentiation, really simple uh, principle of training. Each phase has its own goals, as it always does. But phase potentiation realizes that each phase also has to set up the next phase most beneficially, right? Uh, to continue the stupid food analogies, phase potentiation is seen in a variety of things, not just in sport periodization. It's seen in uh, restaurant menu design. Uh, appetizers are in, in, uh, notoriously, at, at, at least, uh, at, I don't know, I don't go to any fine dining places, but I have been told that at fine dining establishments, the size of the appetizer is very important. Because appetizers are fucking delicious, right? You always want more of them. But if you eat too much of an appetizer, that's awesome. But then your dinner shows up and you're like, eh, I like, can I take this in a to-go bag or eat some of it? The, the actual experience of flavor isn't as awesome. The point of the appetizer is twofold, to be amazing by itself and to make you a little bit hungrier and excited for the main course. And the way they pick the appetizer and main course oftentimes complimentary. So if the appetizer is awesome, but also sets you up best for enjoying the main course. Do you guys ever finish one kind of food? You're like, man, you know what I'd kill for right now is this other thing. Like, and are like pregnant women do like pickles and ice cream or something like that, right? As soon as you eat, just eat a normal dinner food, right? A lot of times that makes you want dessert more than before you start eating. That's a type of potentiation where someone would say, okay, mac and cheese with ground beef and then chocolate cake. Whereas if you flip the order, it might be like, you know, after a piece of chocolate cake, are you ever like, man, you know what I really go for is mac and cheese? Who the hell says that? That's really rare, right? That if you eat mac and cheese first, you may be able to really get a lot out of chocolate cake that you wouldn't normally. Same idea for training potentiation. So anytime we do a mouse cycle of training, we have two concerns, not one. The obvious concern is, is this mouse cycle producing a good hypertrophic stimulus. Of course, that's always the number one concern. But a number two concern, which we can't just completely diffuse, has to be, okay, but how does this training phase now set up our next training phase? Is it going to be, you know, a disaster? It's kind of like before going on a trip, do you want to clean up your room and clean up your house or apartment? Uh, you know, you think like, what the the fuck am I doing that for? I'm going to be on a trip. There's no purpose for my house to be clean. I'm going to be away. But hold on. When you come back from the trip, you're stressed out. You've been flying. You can't wait to be home. Do you want to come home to a nasty, dirty house or a super clean house? It feels so fucking amazing to come home and everything's clean. You're like, oh my God, I can just relax. This is great. Versus coming home and there's like flies and shit. Maybe not that bad, right? There's clothes everywhere and you're like, can't find the remote to relax. Like this sucks. Being home sucks. That's another classic example of not just being concerned at what happens now but being concerned of how now affects later and preparing for it. So each phase is not a standalone, but the entire structure is a distinct sequence of events, one making sure to take care of its own needs and prepare the next one. So how does this apply to volume in hypertrophy training? Here's the deal. Minimum effective volume goes up every week or every few weeks. Absolutely, okay? As you expose the body to more stimulus, it gets more and more resistant to that stimulus and you need more and more to keep making even minimum gains, right? Over a mesocycle, it goes up substantially, but it is reduced considerably during a deload, one of the main functions of a deload. However, it is not reduced completely. So what ends up happening is over multiple mesos, you know, accumulation, deload, accumulation, deload, accumulation, deload, the MEV can actually start to trend upwards, especially for a distinct 
a group of exercises in a distinct repetition range. So like, for example, squats in the five to 10 range, the MEV for that, how many sets you have to do to get some quad growth is going to go up meso to meso to meso. For example, and this is a good, just theoretical example, this is not a hard rule for sure, but if you've gotten this far in hypertrophy concepts and tools, you know for sure that's not a hard rule. Maybe your MEV is 10 sets in the first meso, 12 sets in the second, 14 in the third, and the fourth meso, 16. Notice, before we move on, a 16 set MEV per week, but that's getting up there. Compared to 10, just by itself, it may be something we want to address sooner or later. We can't keep going like this, right? What about MRV? Well, MRV during a, a mesocycle, for, for the first few weeks, it actually goes up because your work capacity expands, right? You start doing squats in the five to 10 range that are a little bit novel. If you just did max squats in one week, you wouldn't be able to do that many. It would you shit the bed, right? Because you're not very efficient at the movement and you're not really ready to recover from the movement, so on and so forth. But as you do more and more squatting week to week to week, your MRV actually goes up. Your maximum recovery volume, your ability to recover from the, from the most volume you can goes up because you get more used to the exercise. Your work capacity goes up, your efficiency goes up, and so on and so on and so on. Those are all good things. However, towards the middle and end of the meso, it starts to flatline and, and decline. Why? Because cumulative fatigue cuts it like crazy and it's going up exponentially, right? So at first it goes up and then it starts to flatline and then it comes down. Good news because when it comes down, it's really easy to detect. That's when you know how to deload. Awesome. During a deload, you drop fatigue like crazy. So the MRV rises significantly again at the beginning of the next meso but not all the way because some cumulative fatigue continues to hang in there over the course and start, sort of grows over the course of multiple measures. Because remember, deload brings down most fatigue, but not all fatigue. So in a block of let's say four mesocycles, MRV probably climbs for the first one or two mesos because again, your work capacity and efficiency improvements are so awesome. Then it probably flatlines towards the third meso in many cases and then begins to decline, right? So we have the situation here. Here's an example. Your MRV might be 20 sets per week of some exercise on the first meso. On the second, it might be 22. Then it goes back down to 20. Still good training, no worries in the third. And then it goes down to 18, even lower than it was in the first one on a fourth meso. Now think about it, your fourth fucking meso of grinding hypertrophy training, it's not really a surprise that your MRV is lower than it used to be multiple mesos ago when you were completely fresh, right? So how is this a problem? Well, here's the big problem. Take a look at that red box really quick. After about four mesocycles, just an example, happens for some people at three, happens for some at six, seven, or eight mesos of, of consistent training, we have a big problem here. Our MEV example went from in meso one, 10 to 12 to 14 to 16, okay? And our MRV example went 20, 22, 20, 18. Take a look, forget about the red box for a second, I'm just mind fucking you now. Look at the first month, the first mesocycle of training for both MEV and MRV, 10 and 20. That's a big ass range. You start at roughly 10 sets, you go all the way to 20 sets, you deload. That's a whole lot of weeks of incrementally raising volume and getting amazing, amazing gains. That's a ton of time spent around the maximum adaptive volume. What about in the last block, and this could be worse, or sorry, the last mesocycle starts with 16 and goes to 18? What does that mean? You raise sets for two weeks and then you're done? That's terrible. That might mean that you have to raise a set only once every other week, which could not lead to maximized responses. In either way you cut it, either you're not stimulating a whole lot more growth between weeks or you do way fewer weeks, which is to say your actual training uh, mesocycle, the fourth one is just not very hypertrophic. Okay, you arrive fucked up and you get fucked up faster than usual past the point of where you can recover, right? And you may have experienced this before. Advanced and intermediate trainees will know like starting a fourth or fifth mesocycle when you should have like cut your mass phase and done a maintenance already. And like week one, you're like, well, oh, how many more weeks of this shit do I have to do? Whereas like the first one or two mesos week one, you're like, I can't wait to do eight fucking weeks of accumulation. So it's a big deal. It's an obvious, obvious problem. And the problem is that the average volumes get very, very high, but the stimulus sensitivity is very, very low as noted by the super high minimum effective volume. Cumulative fatigue is very high as noted by the super high MRV, right, to start with. That is not an ideal training situation. If you choose to do another mesocycle of training, you're essentially saying, okay, I know that the amount of stimulus I get is gonna suck and I have to work like crazy to get a decent stimulus, 
but hold on. Your ability to work like crazy consistently sucks because your maximum recovery volume is so low because your cumulative fatigue is so high. It's the worst of all worlds. It's like working on a group project at school or for a, a corporate job, you're working on some kind of proposal or presentation and you have like two days to get it done, you got 10 or 12 hours of great work in one day and now you have like a really conceptually difficult problem that you have to tackle in order to finish the last several hours of work. Do you stay late that night to finish it? There's a good argument for no because you're already super fucking tired. So really difficult conceptual problems. You just might be staying with your coworkers like looking at the stuff, charting all the data and be like, I don't even know what the fuck we're doing here anymore. I don't even remember the last time I slept. I've had one too many monsters where my brain is just buzzing and nothing's going on, right? So the amount of effort you have to put into solving this task is very high, but your preparedness for it is very low. Fuck that. It might be time to cut off the day, go home, get some food, get some sleep, come back early to the office the next day, recharged, blow that project out of the water, and then four hours later, toke up with your homies as you know the designated person goes to submit the files to the boss, right? That might be a better idea than just cranking all the way through. So in enters the maintenance phase of hypertrophy training. Here's the thing, an active rest phase of roughly two weeks can reduce a ton of fatigue. And many times it is the right idea to do after a whole block of training when you hit that last muscle cycle that's very grotesquely inefficient, right? Or has a low stimulus to fatigue ratio. However, often, not always, psychological fatigue is up there. Like if you've been grinding for eight months, two weeks away from hard training might not cut it. You might come back after two weeks and be like, fuck this. I'm like allergic to the gym. You see a dumbbell press and you're like, no, 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 no. Give me the hell out of here, right? Like that's how messed up you are psychologically. It happens when you train super hard. Connective tissue fatigue might take longer than two or three weeks to really come down. You may need a longer break and many of the best bodybuilders in the world take way longer breaks. So in addition to that, some volume sensitivity may take a little longer than two or three weeks to reduce possibly. So we have to maybe step away for a little bit longer. We have to conserve muscle, so we can't just leave the gym altogether, but we have to do that by training in as low of a volume as we can for probably about a mesocycle to bring fatigue of all kinds, psychological, connective tissue, and so on, super, super low, arguably as low as it's ever been in your career, minus wear and tear that you can't prevent, and to really resensitize for training volume so that you get the most on a technical level from another accumulation phase later, right? That's exactly what a maintenance phase is. And how do you pick the exercises for this thing? Well, it depends on how much joint and connective tissue fatigue you bring in. Because people say, well, hey, maintenance phase, I want to use it to get a little stronger because it's normally low volume. Is that a good idea? Maybe, unless your hips and knees are so fucked up that doing lunges is fine, but doing heavy squats just isn't going to work. So if you are really, really messed up, choose exercises that have lower joint and connective tissue impact than others. For example, some bodybuilders after a really big mass phase before the pre-contest diet where they take their downtime, they'll use exercises like a lot of cables, a lot of machines, not a ton of weight, not a ton of reps, just kind of moving some blood through and getting some good uh, sort of anti-catabolic stimulus going where you think like, well, why don't you just be more efficient if you just did barbell incline press? But like, well, my shoulders, elbows are so fucked up from six months of awesome massing training, I just can't do that. It's just not going to work, right? So I have to use intentionally easy exercises. I myself have done this before, right? Deadlifts and bent rows, there's not always the time for them. And sometimes during a maintenance phase, because muscle maintenance is so easy, if you do cable rows and you do some, you know, stiff-legged deadlifts and pretty light ones, you can maintain all that muscle you earn deadlifting and bent over rowing, but really let everything heal, especially joints and connective tissues, which could be irritated, right? On the other hand, if your joints and connective tissues feel fine, but your psychological fatigue is high and your volume sensitivity is low, you can absolutely use the hardcore heavy basics, no problem at all. Ideally, you want the reps in the lower ranges, you want to keep the metabolites low, you want to get very not close to failure because you just want to minimize the total amount of fatigue that is being incurred. You're not there to train hard. You are there to train easy, just barely hanging on to your gains, but letting the resensitization wave come up super, super high. Volumes are going to be at maintenance volume, which often, our little heuristic we use here, is a third of your maximum adaptive volume. So for example, if we go back, 
that uh, first mesocycle uh, that we talked about, uh, an MEV of 10 and an MRV of 20, that means the MAV average is roughly 15 uh, sets per week. That means for every week on average of the maintenance phase following this block, you do one third of 15, five working sets per muscle group for this example. That Yes, that does mean you do three sets of squats on Monday and two sets of leg presses on Thursday and that's it for a whole mesocycle, month, month and a half of training. The bad news, you will grow zero muscle doing that. The good news, you won't lose any muscle and your volume sensitivity, your connective tissue fatigue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are gonna come crashing down or like volume sensitivity, volume resistance comes crashing down, sensitivity comes up, all of a sudden you are in an absolutely excellent place to do as good of a job as you can, right? What this results in is a certain kind of block design. A typical training block thus will spend one to three mesos in accumulation. Four plus mesos is definitely possible, but for intermediates and advanced, it's much more rare because they just won't be able to last that long. Their MRVs are already being capped by their super strength and they're getting close to their genetic limits. So their MRVs aren't crazy high, but their MEV has over the career come up. So for them, if they do five mesos in a row, they may cross MEVs and MRVs all together. Whereas for beginners, five mesos in a row, they still have a pretty good separator between the two, right? One meso of maintenance is usually good enough. Three to four weeks of maintenance in that phase is usually good enough for most people, but err on the side of more. It's super tempting to be like, three to four weeks, you know, I'm gonna do two and a half and I'm fucking ready to go. If you were wrong and it turned out that you didn't drop all the fatigue you needed to, you didn't resensitize all you needed to, halfway through or two thirds through your next block, your next macro cycle, you're gonna realize you need to screw up your whole training plan to take more time off. That sucks. Whereas if you err a little bit on the side of more, you for sure cleared all the space and you're really almost no downside because what the hell is another week and a half in the grand scheme? And I'll tell you, it's nothing. So there's no rush. There's a rush to do it right, not a rush to do it as fast as humanly possible because that almost airs you all the time. It's like this. If you're on a road trip and you're going through like the, the American West and there's a gas station every like 200 miles or something like that, uh, you know, when you get to a gas station, do you go pretty close to full tank or are you like, oh, you know, that road sign says the next gas station is 150. I'll just do half a tank. Like, yeah, or that gas station is closed, or it's a fucking old sign, Hills Have Eyes type shit, Nevada. Who the hell knows if the aliens didn't put that sign up, right? Are you really gonna bank get stuck in the Nevada desert because you were like, oh, well, one and a half's good enough. That's the same thing of rushing your maintenance, right? Like you're filling up the car and your friends are in the car, right? And they're like, come on, let's go, man. We gotta get to California. You're like, ah, fuck this. I'm not gonna fill up the car. I just gotta have fun with my friends. Eh. Maybe just fill it up. And hey, look, if there's a gas station 150 miles away, sweet. You're like, how much did you really lose? Literally 30 seconds of doing this and filling the gas pump. Same thing, a week, extra week, week and a half of maintenance just to really settle in, costs you no muscle. And if anything, it heals joint and connective tissue fatigue and psychological fatigue so much, it might make your overall career longer, right? And then you repeat this sort of template based on your situation needs. I will say, not the last thing is we have one more slide, but most of the best IFBB professional bodybuilders, they do a lot of shit wrong and fucking weird for sure. But this is one thing a lot of them have really, really right. Almost all the best pros take a nice one to two month maintenance period once or twice in a competitive year, okay, at least once. Ronnie Coleman was notorious for after he finished the Olympia and the European tour after, he took like one to three months of just recreationally training, eating high protein foods, not really tracking anything and, and doing hardly any hardcore training at all. Everything would heal, everything would come down and then he would start his off season run up and start really pushing for the Olympia which would fucking win eight years in a row. I've been in the sport long enough as a shitty, mostly person who watches the sport and a shittier competitor to see that people that push it, show after show after show, cut cycle, boom, mass, cut, mass, cut, mass, no maintenance, they tend to burn out much more. And they don't last into the 30s and 40s and really, really make as much of a mark as they could have made on the sports. Give that some thought. Now, lastly, how does this change during fat loss dieting? Well, MEV goes up faster, right? Because you have a ton 
of catabolism going on, and you need to counteract that with further increments of MEV. Fatigue goes up faster, also raising MEV, and of course, MRV will fall probably the entire time, right? MEV doesn't fall as fast as you would think because fibers convert to slower twitch and your work capacity improves real fast if you lose body fat. So MRV doesn't like go like this during a fat loss phase, but it will eh, go like that, right? So this is a problem because if you just run your normal progression of adding volume, you know, but a certain sequence, you're going to do like a three week accumulation in a mesocycle and it just shit the bed. So what you might want to do is use a little bit less volume addition every mesocycle. This lengthens the meso and allows longer blocks to be used, actually getting you to your goal. You'll notice a problem automatically. You say, well, hold up, Mike, isn't, don't we add volume by pure auto regulation perceiving the stimulus to fatigue ratio and perceiving how, how disruptive the exercise is. And if we're recovering and if uh, on time, don't we just add more volume? Yes, to stay at MAV. But to stay above minimum effective volume, you actually can take a much less proactive approach and say, okay, ideally I would add two sets to this. I'm just going to add one because I know if I add two, I'll have a great workout this week, but the next week I'll have exceeded my MRV. So by definition, if we use this sort of less incremental addition of volume, violating the set progression algorithm or sort of tampering it down a little bit, what we end up doing is, yes, we're trading off MAV training. It's not the best training you could get, but it's above minimum effective volume or above maintenance volume for sure. So we're not losing any muscle and we get to do high quality training for longer, which means we get to keep our muscle while burning fat for longer. Because you have to deload every third week. That really fucks up your training. And you, you have to take diet breaks every deload, which is a very good idea. You don't diet through deloads because obviously the entire purpose of a deload, you lose muscle and you don't drop fatigue. So, you know, if you have to deload super often, it screws up your momentum and it screws up the efficiency of your cut. But if you manage, instead of doing this to your volumes, doing this in every single minute cycle, you still accomplish all of your goals. You still have maintained all of your muscle, possibly gained a little bit, but you get these long stretches of time to really apply your diet and really, really get lean, right? So still the same phase potentiated structure here, but maybe in a deficit, two mesocycles back to back is ideal, not three, or maybe three and not four. A lot of times you'll be able to have more mesos or longer mesos when you're gaining weight or maintaining it than if you are losing it. This is obvious stuff uh, when you've thought about it for a while, but I used to make this mistake all the time. Like I'm gonna do like a five block cutting phase and after block, or sorry, five meso cutting phase and after meso number four, I'm like, I can't, my MRV is two sets higher per week than my MEV. This is stupid, right? Not, not really a good idea. In the end, make sure you pay attention to fatigue dynamics, to stimulus dynamics, specifically at the end of each meso, ask yourself honestly, are you really good to go for efficient, effective stimulus to fatigue ratio or high stimulus to fatigue ratio training in another meso? And there's no ego in this at all. If you can honestly tell yourself after an accumulation phase, man, I need a break. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Take your deload, take a maintenance phase or an active rest, and then you'll be golden for multiple more mesos. There are no trophies and no awards for being like, I feel like shit, but fuck that. The, the process goes on. Why? Why? Just do the right thing. Back away when you have to, of course, work hard. But remember, if I have to tell you to work hard, you don't need to be watching this. You need to be watching videos that yell at you and tell you to work hard or something. Maybe videos can't help you. So hard work is an underlying foundation of everything. On top of that, work smart. Back off when you have to. Be honest about how good you're, how high a quality of training you're getting. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in. See you next time for Lecture 22.